Salutations. It's an honor to be here with you all and uh, present, uh, you know, the final makeup of uh, Inconvenient Truths. Tipping the Scale of Transcendence is the piece that um, that is finalized and the title um, that is bestowed upon it. And we're going to deep um, take a deep dive into why. So I just want to thank you all um, and those that were a part of this exciting project. It was truly an honor. Um, so everyone that, um, you know, was working with Kimura um, for uh, Kimura's Cultural Corner and, and you know, um, all the employees at the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, you know, you guys really impressed and um, really fueled my soul in creating one of my most exciting pieces, I think, to date, right? So um, Harriet's Inconvenience Convenient truths, I call it hit, right? Rightly so, um, because I wanted to make sure that it had the impact um, that that conversation had on me, right? And so it was a reciprocal um, effort that I think took place where I kind of served as a soundboard in a certain way um, and, and almost like a um, uh, a, a sponge, which, you know, I'll allude to like later on in this piece, but uh, you know, I think that we really gathered a lot. There was a lot there. Um, I mentioned it before where I probably could have made a few pictures, um, but I tried to strategically and, um, and with purity implore what it was that our the main threads in our discussions and what took place and hopefully you you gain the sense that I was actively listening and that um, you know it's something that we can all be proud of because um, I think that we are embarking upon um, a, a great measure of change and a great visual um, that you all really like fed into and steered the ship of so I can't thank you enough. So as we explore the elements um, surrounding Uncle Tom's cabin and other areas within our discussion, uh, with, uh, without further ado, here we go. So starting at the bottom with the cabin, right? So the cabin serves as the cornerstone of the painting, hence why it's down in that bottom um, right hand. Um, it's where the cabin is being flooded. Um, there's a name played um, for for Henson, right? You know, of course, alluding to Josiah Henson. And um, we also have um, sprayed upon there is Uncle Tom, right? And, uh, you know, it was very eye-opening and telling about how Henson used the moniker to market um, himself while he was going um, across, you know, different areas where he was, you know, talking about his life story, which he was the model for Uncle Tom, right? And so there's um, intentionality um, between the color, right, and being Uncle Tom because we can see it in a negative light or with negative connotation, um, you know, in this day and age, especially amongst um, African Americans and, um, and indigenous folk. So, you know, this kind of, you know, brings it back to that root, right? And then linking with that and also being the same color is, you know, war, right, which is over the top of the Band-Aid that has civil. And we know that if, if being civil, if seeking um, civility when we're communicating with one another or voicing our opinions is like the highest bar, then that's a problem, right? <laughs> um, you know, maintaining poise is something to definitely be proud of, but it shouldn't be, it should set the standard. It shouldn't be what we um, uh, aspire to achieve, right? And so it just shows how shaky it is when, you know, the nation at this point, um, right, I'm talking about back then, but also maybe talking about now, when um, being civil is the, um, it, is is the the apex of who we are as human beings then you know we're we might be on the brink of some change right that needs to take place in order for us to evolve so hence why war is over there and of course put together we got civil war right um and then there's a tongue-in-cheek play on harry's work right um so you know during the time where you know abolitionists and everyone that was um, looking for progress 
um, to end slavery um, when their points couldn't get across maybe until this point where Uncle Tom's Cabin was released, um, it just shows that um, the message is falling on deaf ears, right? And so hence there's an ear that is laying on the roof of um, of the cabin, but it also symbolizes Harriet and her listening in, right? And 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 really um, seeking some sense of of empathy that might be there um, in terms of being able to tell this story in such a passionate and and vibrant way that got the message across so much so that Abraham Lincoln um, coined her the uh, the quote unquote little lady that started the Civil War right um, and then of course she used um, the uh, the Bible um, to really flip the perspectives that that people were thinking were who were at like the top as far as like piety and and righteousness um really letting them know like hey you know if you are silent um during this um dur during this time of of recognizing what needs to change then you're guilty as well and i think she put that in folks face when she created uncle tom's cabin Moving up, we have the train, which is carrying cargo with stages of challenging intention, right? So inspiration is first, interpretation is second, and appropriation is strikingly last as the white caboose with a shallow X over the top. Um, along the train's travel are pieces of litter or literature, if you will, connecting to the body of water above, right? So those um, those uh, pages create these ripple, the uh, rippling effect, right? A ripple effect. Um, the slices set um, on each of the shoulders, they actually come from the painting that we went through and that we observed, or one of which that we checked out during the workshop, right? And it stems from my great friend, Andre Rochester, who, um, you know, metaphorically pointed to the inequality uh, in, in it, inequities um, through dessert servings. Uh, so the slices that are set over on the left, they embody a one-way path which presents options on the unmarked headstones. So on that first one that's in the forefront, we can see that it's being marked with option number one, which is, is freedom, right? There's an X over it. Um, in order to gain freedom at this time, it meant that chances are you had to risk your life right or maybe your loved one's lives in order to um, gain freedom um the second is the underground railroad right same thing you gotta risk your life in order to gain gain freedom um and um this also ties in of course to that train that's going right and who's telling the stories of how folks are seeking their liberation and the value of that and what that really means especially if you're coming from the perspective of the third headstone which it says the black man right and so these unmarked graves that can be spotted right in our own backyard um are uh, symbolic of you know the people that sacrifice themselves in one form or another to help um, build, you know, what we see today and what we've become accustomed to over the years. Um, and so there's, you know, parts of our Hartford landscape that can be recognized within here and that gold, um, the gold building is linked with, you know, the um, one of the links of the choker necklace that are being um, broken from bondage, right? Um, but we shouldn't overlook uh, the um, the impact and the connection that our the empire that we see today and how it was made and, and where it stands, right? And so that's over there on the left side. Now over on the right side, that has um, you know green pastures, right? Um, it's, uh, it still has dismantle dismantlement of those of those links of the choker necklace, um, but on this side is through like literature. Um, there's an X through enslavement or at the budding part of enslavement, which also is symbolized to break those chains, right? Um, and then moving downward, we have these green books that are sitting on top of each other. One indicates that it is the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass an American slave um, and then the other 
out there in front, it's kind of like a, a time warp um, because it came up during our discussion is the green book for um, Negro travelers, right? Which is buried behind um, showing that connection, right? While folks were looking for safe havens um, in the Underground Railroad and along their travels, um, you know, during times of enslavement, it was the same thing after, right? During times of reconstruction and even now, right? Where folks are looking for these safe spaces in order to flourish um, and find ways for them to express themselves and really come to grips with who they are and where they can be appreciated and valued. Lastly, that slice that's down there um, it symbolizes an open book. Um, so there's there's pages within there that, you know, uh, converges into the sea, showing a rippling effect on one side, and then it kind of crashes ashore on the other. So, in between these shoulders is the collarbone, right? And I think that this is probably the heart of our discussions or a series of discussions. Um, so we see the words on the Kit Kat that says somatic abolitionism. Um, and here, um, this area captures, uh, you know, what that means, right? So it's a living embodied philosophy that recognizes and heals our bodies of the white body supremacy virus, which infects us all. The collarbone bridges the bars, um, referencing uh, Kit Kat conversations that manifest in our daily lives, but especially in environments where discourse is met with dissonance and discomfort, right? And that's really, um, what the whole, um, you know, what the the center really stands for is like, how do you navigate these tough conversations from um, people who might visit there with these uh, glaringly different backgrounds, right? And how do you, um, you know, help them you know, and how do you facilitate a conversation where people see it from a, a whole different side or they're brought there um, for different interests, right? Um, and so, you know, we talked about Kit Kat conversations and then also softball conversations. So if you look um, upstream, you can see that there's a softball for the face of the watch or the clock that's there, right? And um, it's busting at the seams. And the reason why is because with softball conversations, they, um, they uh, represent you know, just where pleasantry is paramount and, and easy, right? And where truth can be disguised. So um, we um, talked about the differences um, between politeness versus um, strategic conversations and different approaches that way, where sometimes they can be misconstrued. Um, and so we can also see that those hands of, of the clock are like stretched across, across the body, casting a shadow, right? And so it, it stands for one of the, um, the, uh, the quotes that we often drew upon and like, what does it mean for Harriet to be a woman of her time, right? And being, you know, locked into this box of, you know, what it means to be a female of this time and, um, you know, the impact that she may have had from that stance and what that may mean just um, from a human um, aspect, right? So when we go up a little bit further, we can check out A Tale of Two Harriets. So I alluded to it before, but um, now we're going to do a deeper dive. So this um, this area represents, um, you know, the uh, uh, dichromatic dichotomy, right? So this split of two people with um, representing two different complexions or tones, right? So, um, you know, though they have these, dis these, uh, these different features, which represent different um, experiences, they also share some of them and aren't too far off from others. So on one side, um, it represents Harriet Jacobs. The other side represents Harriet Beecher Stowe. Okay. Now in the center, they share the same mouth, right? It's a blossoming Uncle Tom tulip or a double late tulip, which I found super cool because it, it has these um, double sets of petals, right? That 
uh, that overlap with one another. Now inside here, there emits this light. So they are able to eloquently express themselves and beauty just radiant radiates out of that but in order to get to that point there's some sacrifice and some recognition within those sacrifices that take place all right so when we look at the um the black crane over on the left is whispering into harriet jacobs um ear that you know everything is going to be okay and that you know a change is going to come you know where to sam cook right um but that there's transformation that will take place there's cranes like all throughout the um the stove center and um, I wanted to highlight uh, um, a black crane, right? Um, uh, a, a Western African, um, ironically, uh, crane, you know, that's coming over, that's dropping these jewels and like letting, um, kind of giving Harriet Jacobs um, the understanding and the presence to say, okay, yeah, you're going through hell right now, but you'll get through this, right? And she she wrote about that um, in in her her novel and her autobiography about like the horrific aspects of of slavery right and she also sent some of that um that information over to um harry beecher stowe who didn't use it for uncle tom's cabin but um use it for uh a derivative of that for the keys to uncle tom's cabin right and so you have this super raw authentic um view from an actual former you know an emas em emancipated slave um who really went through it and then also had the ability to write about it. Um, it reminds me of uh, like the the Steve um, Bilko uh, story, right? Where you know his view was told through the lens of the person who was just recording it, right? And so a lot of this came up in conversation when it come when it came to the authenticity and the purpose of being presented in this light. And so um, on the uh, staying on the same side. Um, if we look um, at, you know, the the way that, you know, everything is is being is being captured, um, and then follow that flow over to the opposite side, um, we see that there's a hummingbird that's whispering in Harriet Beecher Stowe's, um, you know, ear, and kind of has to carve through, and there's like black petals that are over there, right? Um, but that just, you know, captures the empathy that she was able to, um, to to pinpoint and how that was able to be pollinated over on the other side. But that's not without, you know, having influence and talking to um, Josiah Henson and then also uh, maybe having some attributes from Harry Jacobs herself in order to tell that story um, in such a captivating manner. So when we zoom in on these eyes now, and we look over on the left, we can see that Harriet Jacobs has um, a compass, right? And that compass, that eye um, is labeled, it's the eye of truth, right? And so um, there's Sojourner and there's truth, right? Which was another great influence when it comes to um, Harriet Beecher Stowe. On the left side of the of the um, of the scales of justice, we have it it's starting to kind of become decrepit, right? It's starting to weaken. Um, you know, that's where it doesn't hold a lot of weight, but there's tears that are pouring, uh, right? There's there's water that's coming down the cheek. Um, and then on the right side, there's blood that's coming down, right? And that's the heaviest sacrifice, okay? And that's something that uh, is indicative and really represents what um, what these uh, what, what what slaves went through okay and what people still are living with till this day and those um and that blood drips down and it actually like feeds the color of um of the tulip that we um just visited on the previous slide okay now 
over on the right side for Harry Beecher Stowe, we can see that there's a mirror, okay? And this this mirror um, represents, it reflects her, her son, Charlie, who passed away. And that was really the catalyst uh, that, that allowed Harry Beecher Stowe to discover that sense that, that, um, that deep loss and relate to what um, what slaves were going through and how they were how their families are being torn apart. And so the mirror reflects what she is observing over on the other side of this injustice, right? And she was able to harness this, capture this, and feel this. And that's why you have the tears that are feeding um, that are dripping down her her face on this side and feeding into um, the tulip. Also, I want to note that, you know, I was going to create Charlie so that, you know, it was, you could tell that it was Charlie and that it was re at least related to Harry Beecher still. But instead, I wanted to leave it a little bit more um, ambiguous and so that anyone can see their child um, in there, right? Or a loved one, someone who's young and that's vulnerable and that is filled with innocence and that had their life taken away from them, right? Or is being um, is being mistreated, right? And because that's how Harriet saw it and she was able to relate it, re relate to other people and be um, humble enough to understand what others might be going through. And I think that's what resonated when, um, when she wrote uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. So we have the caged birds up top, the caged birds quest. Um, the key to compassion is empathy, right? As I just, you know, dwelled upon a little bit in the last slide. So to get their humility must be endured. Uh, the, the keyhole uh, operates as an entry point to the crown and the mind. The crown is placed upside down because flipping our current scope of competence opens new dimensions. One side is sturdy and resilient, bearing turmoil, and the other is tarnished, dissipating in the sky, a sign of change. Carved in the upside down crown are the words courage, and, all capital, and it's all capitalized, right, because it's bold, and curiosity, right? is eloquently written in um in cursive demonstrating um you know the um elusiveness that can come with trying to discover new elements in our lives these factors do overlap with one another facing pain grief or the unknown can become hollow without a sense of curiosity being inquisitive without the willingness to address something wholeheartedly can be futile, right? So when you have um, both of them operating um, at the same time, I think that's when you have something that's sustainable, that's authentic, and that, you know, you should really go and embark upon. Um, the birdcage is modeled from Stowe's room, right? Um, and so it's a space that can be filled or can be, re or could be removing ideology ideology schemas and also frameworks that we become accustomed to um, to living with um, both Harriet's um, were courageous enough to observe absorb process and execute in immeasurable ways they were open-minded enough um, to be able to tell their truths and also do it so with um, a sense of like grace and and sturdiness right so one of the discussions that came up um, happened to be uh, talking about authenticity of certain works, right? And so I was put on to uh, the Birch Bark House um, and then and how it mirrors um, what Little House on the Prairie was about, right? But it came from, uh, you know, quite different um, perspectives uh, and, and different different areas um, right within our nation, right? Um, so we, we really talked about what intent may be there and how it could be perceived in the final product, right? And how we may come across when we're um, putting that out into the world after we really process and um, put forth, uh, you know, how we're going to articulate ourselves and how we're going to help facilitate and, uh, and navigate these conversations in these difficult times.
Uh, so the key is um, is on the opposite side of the hair because, you know, it's going to be hard to find in there, right? And that's something that's attributed to wanting to be curious, right? And to be able to uh, have the wherewithal to go past the surface and really find um, what it is that you're that you're looking for, or at least being willing to go on a, a journey to search for um, this empathy. And then um, uh, that key also, you know, represents, you know, folks trying to uh, take the take the time in order to discover self. OK, so after you have a certain level of self-awareness and you're going through uh, so, uh, somatic uh, abolitionism, you're constantly self-evaluating yourself and rightly so in order to see how you're going to interact and engage with others um, and to a point where you can, uh, you know, keep yourself. Uh, intact, right? But also being willing to um, to go out there and and um, and discover something, you know, that's courageous, that is uh, that's worthwhile, and that is a value, and that um, you know translates when 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 having these conversations. So the routes of responsibility. Um, so I just wanted to talk about how I use like real sponge up there as well. Um, you know, just to kind of show how we can all have um, minds and methods of elasticity if we allow ourselves to, if we don't just, you know, stay caged into, you know, who we are and say, well, this is just how I operate, or I'm just here to, like, listen instead of actually, like, engaging and exploring all these different dynamics that we embody, um, you know, as human beings. So holistically, um, Harriet's Inconvenient Truths culminates a journey of self. It is designed to um, prompt key questions in our lives, seamlessly joining our actions to who we are. It hopefully harnesses critical notions like those developed in the workshop series. What are our individual responsibilities and what are our responsibilities as a collective? So you may um, have to operate according to a particular mission or a particular vision, right? Like we have at the, uh, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. Um, but, you know, within there, what is, what is our responsibility and, and how we connect with one another, okay? You know, their, their vision is to be in a world in which engagement leads to empathy, right? Then that key part is engagement. There has to be something that's reciprocal where you're bouncing things back and forth in order to build, right? Um, and then that empowerment can come out of that. And, and then you can um, eventually come for change for good, right? But it's not a linear path, right? Sometimes you might have to take different routes, um, you know, in different ways as seen between the river and the trains in this piece um, or the train tracks, right? Um, sometimes you might have to climb, climb mountains. Sometimes you might have to um, put in a lot of like labor in order to get there. Um, but ultimately, it requires um, being courageous and also being curious to see um, this path through. Um, so I feel like this painting um, is an opus that epitomizes both Harriet's uh, sentient legacy um, while paying homage to the notable contributors such as um, uh, Josiah Henson, Harriet Jacobs, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, um, and many other um, fallen soldiers and, and geniuses that really um, help inspire her and in turn inspires us all to do the great work um, that we're looking to do. Uh, and as Kimora uh, you know, let us know we always got work to do, right? Um, we may see that the glass is half um, empty or half full, but regardless, we, we know that it ain't all the way full and we got some more, um, some more to accomplish and um, some more connections and engagement to make so that we can um, really get to a place where we are um, sharing 
with um, an equal lens in a, in a way that it can transcend um, not only now, but over time, right? So I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Um, you know, I'm sure that the few pages that I wrote about this is a little bit more succinct um, and is broken out within uh, this here. But again, it's been an honor and I really hope that you gained a lot from checking out um, checking out this, uh, this piece here of uh, Harry's Inconvenient Truths. Take care and keep on doing the great work.